morning we light our candles. And this morning we will be lighting three because we are celebrating a God who is three in one. And so we light these candles to remember that God's presence is among us and that our worship is of a God who is with us. Would you sing as we sing?
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. God's word reads. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord.
As we come now to our time of prayer, I want to invite you to take whatever posture is most appropriate for you today. As always, this altar to my right, your left is open if you decide to come and to kneel to the prayer. And as the altar to my left, your right, Pastor Colleen is ready to anoint you. If you need to feel a either for yourself or for someone else, if you feel that you need a special touch from God. Let us pray. <coughs> oh Lord, we come, we kneel before you. We offer ourselves to you. We ask that you would come fill us and lead us. We ask that you would be a guide, a counselor. Lord, on this Sunday, we remember that you are three and one and one and three. We celebrate have not left us alone, that your very spirit 
kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now I'm going to invite Tim to come up and pray for our tithes and offerings. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And I saw a sign this past week at a church that said, Always be thankful. Never stop being thankful. And here as your local church, we're thankful to each and every one of you that you not only give of your finances, but your personal resources and talents and elbow grease to get things done when they need to be done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it is all for the glory of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again we say thank you, thank you, thank you. You have blessed us and continue blessing us over and over and over again. We Thank you that you've given us so much. Help us to be good stewards of what you give us. Help us to be good stewards as a church for the resources you give us. Amen. And thank you, Tim, as always, for leading us um, in our tithes and offerings. I just have a few um, important announcements um, to make you aware of this morning. Um, first off, you probably noticed uh, Pastor Becca and Pastor Levi are not here. They are currently on vacation and will be on vacation for a couple more days. Um, so if you need anything in those few days, feel free to reach out to myself or to Pastor Daniel or Colleen. Um, they are, our contact information is in the bulletin, so you can reach out to us that way. Um, I also just wanted to remind you guys that June is our month of prayer, um, so I'm sure you've been seeing all the email notifications and the Facebook notifications of the different prayer topics each day. Um, I also want to encourage you, um, after the service, to feel free to go back um, to this hallway right back there and take a look um, at one of the cork boards. We have a map. Um, of the community and we have um, a list of specific community organizations and you can feel free to sign up there to pray for a specific organization or pray for a specific area. Um, and then uh, this Wednesday we will not be having Bible study because we will be having our June board meeting at 6 30. 
Um, however, we will be having Bible study on Monday, so at 10 a.m., so if you would like to come to that, you are more than welcome. Um, and then uh, a special announcement, this Saturday, June 18th, um, is our work day as we kind of prep and get ready for the 75th celebration. Um, we've got some work to do, so we'll be here from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, we invite you to come uh, to help make the church a little bit more beautiful. Um, also, we have um, Make a Difference Day weekend coming up. That is going to be June 24th and June 25th. Um, and if you would like to help with that event, or if you would like to um, help prepare for that event, uh, you can see Kelly. Okay, so Friday, this Friday between 10 and 3, if you would like to come help um, sort through all the wonderful donations that we've gotten, um, that would be great. Uh, I also just wanted to um, remind you all about the 75th celebration. It is coming sooner than you would expect. Uh, it is going to be July 31st. Um, and so please mark your calendars, be letting other people know. Um, if you have uh, any more people that you want to invite, let them know to RSVP to stpaulscc at gmail.com by July 10th. Um, also, as part of the 75th celebration, Karen Spalding is looking for choir members um, to sing a special song. Um, so if you would like to be involved with that, you can see her. Um, and I'm sure she would be happy to get you plugged in with that. Um, and that is all of our announcements. Uh, so I'll, as Pastor Colleen said, today is Trinity Sunday. Um, and last week we celebrated the gift of the Spirit and the birth of the church on Pentecost, um, which was a wonderful time of worship in the morning, and we had a special Sunday night service. Um, but in the church year, Pentecost Sunday is followed by the celebration of the whole Trinity. Um, as, so this allows the church to take a look back at who this God is, so that we can see who God has called the church to be. So today we're going to be looking at John chapter 14, verses 15 through 31. Uh, I will I invite you to turn there in your Bibles. This is part of Jesus' long teaching with his disciples on the night of his arrest following his last meal with them. And it's in this context that we have Jesus promising his disciples that the Father will send the Holy Spirit to them. Hear now the word of the Lord from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 31. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has commands, has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes, 
so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us read. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, here I am. May your will be done in and through me this morning. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Amen. Have you ever noticed that we start and end our worship service every Sunday with a proclamation of peace on one another? Every Sunday, we are gathered into worship and we say, may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. And every Sunday, at the close of our service, as we are sent from here into the world, we proclaim, may the grace and peace of Christ be with you. It's like you are breathing in peace throughout the service, and then as you leave, you breathe it out into the world. Because it's peace that gathers it in, and it's peace that sends it out. And this practice of gathering in and sending out with peace goes all the way back to the writing of the New Testament. If you flip open your Bible to any letter of Paul, and you're going to find a blessing of peace at the start of the letter and one to close it. This is because it's important that God's peace is the last word that we hear. Last words are a big deal. We put a lot of weight on the last words that someone says before they die. And if you look at movies and TV, we see people often giving these long-winded, heartfelt speeches as they die. And somehow they always seem to have time to say like one more final thing. But in our passage, we find Jesus' farewell speech, his last words of teaching before his death. They are not the last words that Jesus will ever speak to his disciples thanks to his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And that is a hope that we look forward to as well. But as the pain of Good Friday comes near, Jesus chooses these words, this speech, going from John chapter 13 all the way through John chapter 17. So if you thought what I read this morning was long, I could have read the whole speech. <laughs> and he gives this whole speech to prepare the disciples for his death, resurrection, and ascension. Jesus has told them that he's only going to be with them a little bit longer and that soon he will be going somewhere that they cannot follow. The disciples clearly do not yet get what this means. They don't understand the pain that awaits them on Good Friday. But Jesus does. Jesus knows they will experience the pain of Good Friday and the joy of Easter. But he also knows that then he will have to leave them again when he ascends to the Father. And Jesus tells his disciples, his friends, that if they love him, they should be glad that he is going away. What a strange thing to tell your closest friends who have lived life with you for three years. Why would they be glad? But Jesus is able to say this because he knows that when he goes to the Father, the Father will send the Holy Spirit to the disciples. The Father will send another advocate, another helper, comforter, counselor who will continue in the ministry of Jesus. So Jesus promises not to leave them as orphans because he is coming back. God is coming back. In the form of the Holy Spirit who will act as a guide, a teacher, and a comforter to these disciples. So Jesus can say that it's better for him to leave because he knows what a great gift the Holy Spirit is. But the disciples don't seem to get what a gift the Holy Spirit is. And to be honest, I'm not sure that we always do either. But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? This is what Judas asks when Jesus tells the disciples that he's going away and that the Father will send the Holy Spirit to them. And just as a side note, this is not the Judas who betrays Jesus. This is another one of Jesus' disciples. But I think it's a good question that Judas asks. It's a question that he's not alone in asking. How often have you heard or thought about how lucky the disciples were to get to walk and talk with Jesus? To see Jesus face to face, to see Jesus' resurrected body and to eat meals with him and to interact with him. I think we can ask like Judas, Jesus, why didn't you show 
show yourself to the whole world and not just to a select few. We can ask, why ascend back to the Father and send the Holy Spirit? Why not just stay around for longer to show yourself to more people? With our desire to see people and have that tangible touch, that is a real question. Why not show yourself to the whole world and not just to us? But in typical Jesus fashion, Jesus doesn't give a direct answer to that question. His response is, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. That doesn't really seem to answer the question, but Jesus' answer points the disciples away from a why to a how. Instead of answering why Jesus does not show himself to the whole world, Jesus answers how he is going to show himself to the whole world. It is through those who love Jesus and obey Jesus' teaching. It is through those in whom the Holy Spirit will come to dwell. This is why the gift of the Holy Spirit is so important. That the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, comes to live and dwell in each and every believer. The whole power of the Trinity is present in the life and witness of the believer. So no longer is the presence of God maintained to one person in Jesus Christ or to one building in the temple. Instead, we all become walking temples, moving tabernacles that house the presence of God and proclaim him. Peace to one another as we gather, and peace to the world as we leave. Amen. This is how Jesus is going to show himself to the world. This is how the mission of God will be accomplished. Through those who believe in him, love him, and obey him. Through us. And that's an awesome responsibility. It can feel overwhelming at times. We can ask like the psalmist did, Who are we that you are mindful of us? But we don't bear this responsibility alone. The Holy Spirit encourages us and empowers us because it's not our mission. It's the mission of God that God is inviting us into. God is calling us to participate in God's very nature, which is marked by love and peace. And this is not peace as the world gives it. Jesus' disciples would have been all too familiar with the kind of peace that the world gives. They saw that kind of peace all the time in the way that the Roman military power achieved their so-called peace by stamping out all who might possibly disagree. Peace, as the world gives it, is the kind of peace that requires the Roman government to crucify Jesus because he was a threat to their way of life. But peace, as Jesus gives it, calls for us to give to one another the kind of peace that is willing to lay down one's life for another, because you are seeking their well-being over your own. Because peace as Jesus gives it is not about the absence of violence, no matter the cost. Now this peace is marked by justice and righteousness, by the restoration of all things. It's a blessing, a blessing that we say to one another every time, a blessing that draws us in and sends us out. And bringing about this kind of peace is the mission of God, a mission that we have been opted into. Earlier in the service, Pastor Daniel read the last words of Jesus right before he sends to the Father in the Gospel of Matthew. These words are often called the Great Commission because in them we find Jesus inviting us to be part of the mission of God. In them we are co-missioned to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey Jesus' commands. We are not alone in this either, for God is with us in the Holy Spirit to the end of the age. Amen. Now I think when we hear these words from Matthew, or we hear in John's Gospel the call to show Jesus to the world, we have a tendency to focus on those words, all nations and the world, and to think of other countries or of cities far away. But all nations includes this one, and the world includes those right outside those doors. It includes your neighbors and the people that 
that you work with, and those you see at the grocery store. It includes those who are like us and those who are not like us. You don't really need to travel or to look hard to find the mission of God. Because the mission of God to proclaim and live peace is happening wherever the people of God are. Or at least it should be. So yes, we may wonder like Judas why this is the way that God has chosen to make God's self known to the world. Why God chose to use lowly fishermen and hated tax collectors from Galilee. Why God chooses to use a small church in Kansas City, Missouri. We may even wonder if there could be a more effective way that God could work. But in the end, that's the nature of this God that we serve. The Trinity constantly seeks, constantly draws in the most unexpected people in the most unexpected places, and then sends them out to be God's agents of peace, to show God your love wherever we are. And it may not always make sense to us why God chose to work this way, but the missional Trinity really proclaims peace over us and help us to freely proclaim peace to the world. And I believe that God wants to use us, St. Paul's Church of the Nazarene, that God is calling us to be part of this mission of peace right where we are at in Kansas City, in Raytown, in Independence. If you were able to be at last week's special Sunday night service, then you know that right now we're in a time of vision casting and transition. As we consider how God might be wanting to use St. Paul's to reach and serve those around us. As a mission, we're considering how we might be a part of God's mission to bring peace and wellness to this very community. And so I want to close my sermon in a kind of strange way because I want to close in a time of prayer. A time of silent prayer. I want to encourage us to still ourselves and to listen. Listen for the spirit of truth to guide us in how we can be a part of God's mission of peace. How we can show Jesus to the world, to our community, right here and right now. You're welcome to come down to the altars as we pray. You're welcome to stay in your seats. But either way, I just ask that you take a posture of humility and ask God to lead us. Let us pray. <coughs> Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening.
thank you that you draw us into you. That you have stretched out your hand and proclaimed peace over us. That you have raised us up even though we are undeserving. To take part in your mission of peace. God, we need that peace in the world and in our community. So often look around and we see violence. We see hatred instead of love. God, help us to show the world you. To show the world who you are. That you are a God who is three in one. A God who is relational. A God who loves, who constantly seeks out and draws in. God, show us your way of peace. May your spirit guide us as we are sent out to proclaim peace. May your spirit embolden us, encourage us to be about your mission, not our own, but yours. Our mission of drawing the whole world into you, of showing the whole world who you are. God, may we be agents of your peace. God, to show us what comes next? Show us how to love community. And how to proclaim peace to them through our lives and our actions. God, show us how to be your mission church. You are a God who is always on mission, always seeking out. May we be a part of that mission. And we pray all this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I encourage you all to continue to pray. As we go throughout this month of prayer, and we ask that God shows us what comes next. That God guides every step of our journey. 